So I'm very, very pleased to make the introduction for our first academic panel, which will be led by uh, my colleague, Hannah Halliburta. So Hannah is a star in blockchain research, and she's currently been working with the uh, Bank of Canada. So this is really exciting. Uh, I think it'll be a great panel. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, technology continuously transforms finance, and uh, in, this in this session, we're going to see how uh, one pretty much well-established technology, machine learning, is changing financial activity. And we will also look at the potential of another new technology, blockchain and smart contracts, to do so. Uh, we will have Brian Kelly uh, to tell us how machine learning is improving our ability to predict risk premia shedding light on um, some academic debates about what are the best factors in asset pricing, uh, but also solving some very practical investment problems. Then Jilapa Jaktani will talk not only about machine learning, but also about the new data sources that are enabled by technology. Uh, and, uh, uh, online, uh, online lending, which started with peer-to-peer -peer lending, allowed us to collect new data, new information on borrowers' activity and borrowers' uh, behavior. And Julapa is going to tell us how using this new alternative data along machine learning uh, helps us better uh, price, more efficiently price loans. Then finally, Will Kong will talk about blockchain and smart contracts and their potential to further, um, uh, uh, to further uh, revolutionize uh, data, both data collection and data processing in finance. It is important to keep, it, to keep in mind at the same time, as I'm sure our speakers today will remind us, that these new technologies also come with some undesired risks. So with, uh, with that introduction, let us start with uh, uh, Brian Kelly of Yale School of Management and AQR Capital. Right. All right, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back at my alma mater. Uh, so today we'll be talking about, well, we'll be talking about machine learning and finance, but I want to couch it around a question, which is can machines learn finance? So to give us a little bit of a baseline, all you have to do is look at the popular media a little bit, and you'll understand that it appears machine learning can do just about anything. Deep neural networks, they're accomplishing things that historically we would have considered just absolutely unachievable. For example, they can beat the best chess players in the world. They can drive cars. They can beat the best Jeopardy player in the world. They can recognize speech and translate it on the spot. They can beat the best Go players in the world. I like this example because when they first beat Kasparov, there were headlines around that time that said, that's fine, but chess is an easy game. Go is much more complicated. The machines will never be able to beat humans at that. So you can see exactly how long it took for machines to knock that one off the list. And then, of course, robotics are driven by deep neural networks. This was an example that was in the New York Times a couple weeks ago. The researcher was talking to his robot and said, please show me the letter A. And the robot was surrounded by a bunch of objects. The robot reached down, picked up a cube with a bunch of letters on it, manipulated it in its robot hand, and showed letter A to the researcher. That was all driven by a bunch of sensors in its environment and a neural network that was processing that sensor data. So it seems like machines can really do anything. They can sing, dance, juggle. But the big question in my industry is, can machines learn finance? And I want to emphasize that the answer from my point of view is by no means an obvious yes. It might be useful, and there's a lot of speculation and hope that it will be useful. But what I would like to emphasize is that finance is just fundamentally different from the domains where machine learning has had success to date. So let me just talk about one particular way I think is the most important way that finance differs from things like driving cars, or image recognition, et cetera. And the best way to think about this is really to talk about signal-to-noise ratios. So when I talk about a signal-to-noise ratio, think about the expected success that a human would have in a particular task. So for example, classifying images. I hand 1,000 images to a human, 
and I asked them to categorize them as an image of a cat or not a cat. The human's going to achieve that with an R squared of essentially one. There might be a couple misses here and there if the image is particularly blurry, they couldn't tell if it was really a cat or a dog in that particular picture, but almost always the human will nail it. The reason why is because that's a high signal to noise environment. The signal, what the image represents, dominates the noise in the image, things that are coming from black background or blurriness, et cetera. All right, so now let's contrast with that with finance. If we arranged 1,000 of the top finance experts in the world and asked them to forecast which direction the S&P 500 was going to move tomorrow, our hit rate would be almost exactly 50%. I feel very confident in that prediction. And that's not a shortcoming of the finance researcher or the market participant, that's just a statement about the nature of financial markets. Financial markets are competitive, and because they're extremely highly competitive, they're extremely efficient. And it's the very efficiency of markets that make them unpredictable. It makes the signal to noise ratio in financial markets extremely low. So suppose that I, as the investor, had a good forecast for where the S&P 500 was going to be a week from now. I believed it was going to go up, and I had a really strong conviction about that. I wouldn't wait a week to begin trading. I'd start trading now. And that would start to push up the price now. That very action would actually pull some of the predictability out of the market. But I wouldn't stop there, of course. If there was still some predictability left over, I'd buy more. And I'd buy more, and I'd buy more, and I'd keep pushing the price up until a very particular point the point at which there was no longer predictability. The price today equaled my, guess best, my best guess of where it was going to be a week from now. That's the entire idea underlying efficient markets. Because markets are competitive, because all of these traders in the world are trying to make a buck faster than everybody else, they make markets efficient. They drive down signal to noise ratios. They pull predictability out of the market. All right, so machine learning tools are tools of predictive analytics. They work best in settings where predictability is really high. When you go to recognize a cat, it doesn't make future cat images blurrier. That's essentially what happens, though, when you go to predict in financial markets. If you can make a better prediction, you're making the market more efficient and less predictable. So long story short, finance is just a very different system than the places where machine learning has been historically very successful. So what do we do when we're in a situation that you talk to lots of asset managers these days. They're going around telling their clients that they're developing some machine learning funds, relying heavily on big data and algorithms to put together portfolios. But they can't tell you about what they're doing, because their argument will be they need to protect intellectual property. But based on the argument I just made, machine learning might be really poorly suited for asset management. So when you find yourself in this kind of situation, this is where academics start to be useful. We don't always know if they're useful, but this is where academics can be useful. They can do research and shed light on exactly these questions that asset managers would prefer to be more reticent about. So that's the idea behind this paper that I wrote with some of my colleagues at University of Chicago, Empirical Asset Pricing via Machine Learning. What we're trying to do in this paper is really to just shed a light on what we can get in asset management from machine learning methods. All right, so when you're trying to understand what an asset manager is doing when they say they're building machine learning portfolios, it's a really tough problem. Because a lot of things can be contributing to their performance. For example, they might just have different or more beneficial data in some dimension. That's not about the algorithm at all. We always know that big data is better data. You have more information to work off of, you have a better chance of building a good portfolio. But we can't do that performance attribution. That's what we'd really like to do, split it out to information from the data versus information that's just gained from having a better model, a better, better technique. So in this paper, it's about a comparative analysis of methods holding the data fixed. Right? So my view as a researcher is that if I want to help us understand where machine learning as a method is useful, Let's start with a baseline data set that we all understand really well. I'll tell you about that data set a little bit in, the, in a minute, but it's essentially going to be US monthly stock returns and all of the standard predictors that people have looked at in the literature up till today. All right, so the primary contribution from this research comes in a couple forms. 
First of all, I'm going to argue that machine learning is economically meaningful. Because what we're doing in finance, asset pricing in particular, the entire object of my field of research is to understand an object called the risk premium. Right? Gene Fama's Nobel, he pointed out that this is the centering question in asset pricing. Why do different assets earn different average returns? And why do those average returns seem to behave differently over the business cycle? All right, so that object, the risk premium, is a conditional expectation of a return. Well, what happens when you build a forecast? Let's say you run a forecasting regression. What are you really doing? What you're really trying to do is build a conditional expectation of whatever your y variable is. All right. That's to say, the object that we care most about as researchers in finance is exactly the output from a forecasting tool set. That just means that machine learning is really well adapted to help us understand the field of asset pricing. Hence the argument that it's economically meaningful. All right, so that's also a long, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into too much more depth on this. This is also the idea why it's ideally suited to, to asset pricing. Uh, but I also want to make the point that we're going to provide some empirical context here. And we'll show you that compared to essentially the leading traditional methods that people have studied in the finance literature, you get some incremental gain from doing machine learning. It's not going to be huge. And I think that's a sensible answer. It's not going to be a revolution from using machines to form portfolios. It's going to be an evolution. It's going to take the quantitative investment process that we've been looking at for a long time and putting it on steroids a little bit. That's sort of how the quant industry has been evolving for 30 years. Let's find more, newer, better, bigger data, and let's incrementally improve our methods as we go along to incrementally make our portfolio choices better and better over time. All right, so here's the empirical setting. This is the data set that I'm going to fix myself to. And I really think that this is a data set that if you ask any empirical researcher in finance, they'll know how this data set behaves really well. So again, it's, it's monthly stock returns, all US stocks. All right, so a very efficient market to begin with. I'll be looking at about 100 stock level characteristics that are now prominent, highly cited in the literature. You know them. You've heard of them. Their size, value, momentum, accruals, yada, yada, yada. I'll also be looking at some aggregate predictor variables, things like the aggregate price dividend ratio, the term spread, the short rate, the default yield, a whole bunch of macro variables that people have studied again in the literature and figured out that these are useful for understanding business cycle variation and expected returns. So I'm going to put those together. I'm going to build a bunch of forecasts at the stock level. It's really going to be a big panel model to try and understand returns on each individual stock at each point in time. All right, so we have a lot of ways that we can evaluate the performance of this, per of this particular set of models. Um, and the one that I'm going to be focusing on is to aggregate all of my stock level forecasts into portfolios and see how well my portfolio forecasts does at forecasting portfolio performance. All right? By aggregating up to something like a portfolio level return, it's something that it's easier for you and I to, to have a conversation about. All right, so what is machine learning? What are the methods that we're going to actually look at? Well, the methods that we study for this comparative analysis kind of looks like the chapter outline for any leading graduate textbook on machine learning. So we're going to start with linear models. Linear models include Ordinarily, ordinary least squares. And in fact, that's going to be my benchmark because that is the most standard tool set when you're doing empirical finance. I'm going to look at a particular least squares model as my benchmark, one that uses only three predictor variables. And there's a typo on the slide. The three predictor variables that I'm going to look at are an asset's market equity, its book to market ratio, and its momentum. Okay, it's 12 month momentum. The reason why I want to use this as a benchmark is because it's well known in the literature. That's a highly selected model. It's worked well, and it's worked well for a long time. All right? So in some sense, it's a conservative benchmark. Think of it as what the humans have learned over a long period of time. All right. Beyond that, I'm going to look at much bigger models now. I'm going to have all of my characteristics, size, value, momentum, et cetera, all of these macro predictors put together in much bigger models. So I'll start off with a big linear model, OLS with about 1,000 predictor variables. Then I'll realize right away that that's going to do horribly. So I'll compare to a model that uses least squares, just basic regression, but uses penalization. So you may have heard of things like lasso or elastic net. 
So that's going to basically shrink down the parameterization of the traditional least squares model. All right, so those are linear models. We'll also look at some dimension reduction techniques. You've probably heard of some of these as well, things like principal components analysis and partial least squares. Then from there, we'll move on to more sophisticated, bigger, and now nonlinear techniques. So the first one I'm going to look at is a generalized linear model. This is kind of the easiest way you could put nonlinearities in your model. Instead of just regressing onto x, you'll regress onto x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth. All right, but that's kind of a contrived nonlinear model. We have some true nonlinear models that exist and that are really key components of the machine learning repertoire. In particular, tree-based models, so things like random forests. And then we'll be looking at deep neural networks, which if you think about where the successes are in Silicon Valley, they're primarily dominated by deep neural networks. All right, so. A summary of the main empirical findings before I actually show you some data. The basic conclusion is that machine learning seems to work for portfolio choice. Again, these are not going to be massive gains. They're going to be incremental, but important. All right, where are these gains coming from? They're primarily coming from nonlinearities. The nice thing about doing a comparative analysis with, with a lot of different methods, you can see where some methods work and some methods fail, and then use that comparison to draw inference about what is the source of the gain. So we have really simple models in finance, mostly because we only have simple theories that we find tractable. What we're actually seeing in the data is that we need a lot of nonlinearities, and we need a lot of interactions among, among predictor variables. That means that we need a more sophisticated model, a richer model than we've typically looked at. So if you want to understand where the gains are coming from, from using machine learning, it's from having more flexibility in our model. Another point that is maybe a little bit subtler um, and more relevant for people with some background in this area is that shallow learning outperforms deep learning. So if you ask how a driverless car works or how image recognition works at Facebook, they use neural networks, but they use neural networks with dozens and dozens of layers, all right? which means they are extremely highly parameterized models. What we find is that performance kind of maxes out with a three-layer neural network. So that's viewed as typically a pretty shallow neural network. But I think the reason for that is sort of sensible as well. In finance, we don't have as much data as you have about you know, sensory information from a self-driving car where they have billions and billions of observations. We have a couple hundred months of data to work off of and maybe a thousand predictor variables. So it's not a true big data setting. That means you can't support such a huge deep model. An interest, another interesting point is that this relative performance of nonlinear methods versus linear methods, it becomes wider when I start to look at portfolios rather than individual stocks. And I think this makes sense as well. What happens when I build a portfolio? Taking all of these stocks that have a bunch of individual idiosyncratic noise, and I'm averaging them. That's what you do when you build a portfolio. And in doing so, you average out a lot of their idiosyncratic risk. What does that do? Well, that actually boosts up the signal to noise ratio. It eliminates a lot of the noise in your prediction setting. By eliminating some of the noise, you give these more sophisticated methods a better chance. You kind of bring them closer to their home court, and they do better. All right, so a lot of those statements you can see just by looking at the statistical performance of the model. But as an economist, we want to understand how these performance improvements look from an economic standpoint. So instead of just reporting things in terms of statistics, R squares, et cetera, I'll put them in economic terms in terms of portfolio sharp ratios. And we'll see that the gains are meaningful from that perspective as well. And the best predictors are things that we've sort of known for a long time are predictive. What's interesting now is that we recognize that we need some nonlinearities to really get all the juice out of them in terms of their predictive content. All right, so we have a lot of results in the paper. I have time to go through about two or three. So let's just start with this basic cross-sectional comparison. What happens when I try and forecast the S&P 500 using each of these different machine learning models. So this is my benchmark model here, my OLS with those three simple predictors. I'm going to do all of my fit comparisons out of sample. So what we see is that even the best model from the liter literature, well, that looks kind of data mined. In sample, in the literature, it looks quite good. 
But once we start doing an out of sample analysis, the R squared actually goes negative, which means that you'd actually do better with a naive forecast of something like just the risk free rate. As I increase sort of the richness of the models, here's partially squares and principal components, you see that again, these are linear models. They're more sophisticated, but they're still linear, and they just are not working well. Where do we start to hit gains? We start to hit predictive gains when we get into things like random forest and different neural network architectures. So I mentioned that we have this conclusion that shallow learning outperforms deeper learning. So these are one layer, two layer, all the way up to five layer neural nets. If we were doing image recognition, we'd see R squareds rise, 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 rise as I went to 16, 17, 20 layers. What we're seeing here is that the R squareds top out at three. There's the conclusion that shallow learning is the most useful. All right, so these are in terms of R squared. Those are hard to interpret from an economic standpoint. So I'm going to convert them into a sharp ratio statement. And again, it's useful to think about this from the perspective of the S&P 500. The annualized sharp ratio of the S&P 500 over a long period of time is about 0.4. That's what you could do if you're a buy and hold investor that just puts all your wealth in the S&P 500 and sits. So the question is, how much would I benefit as an investor if I use the predictive information from each of these models to time the S&P 500? Put more weight in when I have a prediction of a high move and less weight in when I have a prediction of a down move. So what this tells you here is the incremental annual R, uh, sharp ratio that you'd get from using the predictive information from each model. So again, these are the models that had negative R squared, so I'm not even considering those. These incremental gains from the nonlinear models mean you go from a sharp of about 0.4 to about 0.6, a 50% increase. Right? So from the welfare of an investor that's trying to save their earnings for their future, that's a very meaningful economic gain. The last thing I want to show is instead of looking, and by the way, this is true for a whole bunch of pre-existing portfolios that people study in the literature. Think about size, value, momentum portfolios if I were trying to forecast those. All right. What I want to do last is say, what happens if I just built my own portfolios by looking at which stocks were the best predicted in terms of their returns coming out of each model, the worst predicted in terms uh, returns coming from out of each model, and then took a long short bet on those. On those. So what I'm going to do is for each method, I'm going to sort stocks every month based on their forecasted return. I'm going to buy the stocks that have high forecasts, sell the stocks that have low forecasts, and track their performance out of sample over time. So here's where you see that even the benchmark model does pretty well. This is like a market neutral portfolio because it's long short but it still has a sharp ratio of about 0.3, right? So there is some information, there is some alpha in that long short portfolio. What's fascinating is that when you go to these more sophisticated nonlinear methods, you start to see out of sample sharp ratios now that are exceeding one. Right. This is on a valuated basis, so I'm not just forecasting small illiquid stocks, I'm actually forecasting big stocks that are big components of each of these portfolios, and we're still seeing the predictive gains there. I've not taken into account transaction costs or anything like that, so there's an overstatement here. But the point is there are gains to be had. All right, so I just want to summarize, come back to this question that I motivated the talk with, can machines learn finance? All right, and I want to put this question in a little bit of historical context. Let's go back to about 2011, when Google started its Google Brain division. At that point, it was unclear how well deep neural nets were going to do in tasks like image recognition, self-driving cars, et cetera. Since then, Google now has roughly 1,500 machine learning, deep learning projects that they're working on. All right. So I, I want to think about the performance here. Although it's incremental, it's not revolutionary, we should think about this as early days. There's a lot of hope for using these methods in finance going forward. You might think about this as something like 2011 cat recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Our next speaker is Jalapa Jaktani. She is a speci senior special advisor at Philadelphia Fed and a fellow at Wharton Financial Institution Center. Welcome. So uh, good morning. 
That's uh, Hannah said, I'm uh, a senior advisor at the Philadelphia Fed, and so I'm required to remind you that everything I say today is my own view and not necessarily uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, here. And so I'm going to talk about the roles of alternative data in fintech lending and how it, how it impacts consumers. Uh, so what kind of alternative data are we talking about? So generally, when we apply for a loan, uh, we know that FICO score is a traditional factor that's used commonly. And uh, for mortgage, you also uh, have to report your income or uh, employment. Now, uh, alternative data currently have been used uh, pretty widely among uh, fintech lenders. And that could include, besides cash flows, uh, which you are now actually allowing uh, fintech lenders to uh, access your bank accounts, uh, your tra uh, bank statement transactions. Uh, also, uh, they are using utility payments, rent payments, your medical payments, your online footprint, uh, all the uh, websites that you have visited. Uh, and how long you're there, how often you go to these websites, your shopping habit, your uh, education and your major, all kinds of information. And uh, so, it, and if you uh, actually allow lenders to access your cell phone, that's a lot of information about you know, all the apps that you load there and what time you get up and, uh, and how often your phone is run out of battery. So uh, all this information could be used. And uh, there are benefits and new types of risk involved in this type of uh, lending credit decision. So I'm going to talk about uh, the benefit and new types of risk and also the impact on consumers. So uh, this is just an example of a real example of uh, a vendor that uh, focus on identity purposes, but also on uh, fraud detection. But uh, the data is a, it's basically it has over 400 members. And you can see some of the example of the members includes uh, Facebook, eBay, Walmart, uh, Citibank, Visa, MasterCard, uh, Equifax. Uh, so a lot of information is the consortium of data that actually pulled together from over 6,000 websites, right? So uh, it is pretty scary to see how much data about all of us is out there. And we don't know whether it's accurate. We don't know if. Uh, who, who is using it and for what purpose. So, uh, so uh, there are benefits to this because we have seen uh, this statistics shows that using this alternative data would allow some, a lot of consumers for, for the US, about 26 million Americans don't have, uh, either don't have bank account or uh, have the credit file. And so by using this alternative data, they are, would be able to uh, be included in the financial system. And it's not just in the US, because uh, particularly in China, we can see that a lot of people don't have a bank account, but they have a cell phone. And that has a lot of information that could be used for credit decision. Uh, there are risks involved, as uh, Brian also said earlier. It's uh, very complicated using machine learning to, uh, to to analyze big data and alternative data. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, for, uh, for this vendor, so every time you log into your Facebook account, for example, about 100 variables are being collected about you. So uh, they can tell, um, and also lenders can tell where you are applying for the loans from. Are, are you sitting in a high crime area? Uh, what kind of routers you're using? Everything is there basically about you. Um, so, uh, so the risk is that we don't know what information is there. We don't know if it's ac accurate. We don't know if it's, uh, the relationship is stable enough going forward. And so there are uh, issues around that. And as regulators, we uh, intend to provide protection to consumers to make sure it's fair. Um, it's also difficult to interpret the results often with the uh, unsupervised machine learning because uh, it's some, some, sometimes just not interpretable. There's no theory that explains the relationship. And we don't know if it is fair because it could be related to uh, uh, race or gender. So uh, from the regulator's viewpoint, uh, there are issues related to uh, black, the black box. A lot of lenders that subscribe to these AI vendors um, 
actually may not really understand how they themselves made the decision, credit decision, because they don't fully understand what's inside the black box. In addition, a lot of AI vendors are actually working, uh, being, sub, uh, uh, being outsourced to uh, working with many large institutions, a lot of lenders, including fintech and traditional lenders. And so if there is something wrong in the black box, it could be a pretty widespread problem. It could potentially impact uh, how we measure systemic risk and financial stability overall. Now, um, I'm going to talk about my research that look at fintech lenders compared with traditional lenders and how uh, it impacts credit access and consumers overall. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, I will list some of the fintech lenders here, and they all have a, a comparative advantage in uh, different kind of uh, unique ac access to uh, different information, alternative data. I'm going to, uh, the consumer lending space, I, uh, there, there's a paper that already has been on the website and actually has been on SSRN top 10 download, uh, looking at using Lending Club data, which is uh, public data on the Lending Club website. And uh, this, is, uh, this is loan level data, and it has all the information, a lot of information about the borrowers. A lot of information also about because every month it is updated with performance. So we could see how it performs uh, over the years. I compare that the Lending Club loan with uh, also loan level data from uh, traditional banks. This is uh, Y14M data is a stress test data that we collect from uh, large, uh, large banks, CCAR banks, uh, loan level, uh, credit card. We focus on only, uh, only loans and credit card that actually is carries a balance. So people actually borrow using credit card as opposed to just use it uh, for, for transaction purpose. And we can compare the rate, controlling for all the risks and see how, uh, how, how the rates compare. Also looking at mortgage uh, space, comparing lending, uh, uh, fintech lending with uh, traditional uh, lenders. And so for this paper, it's still a work in pro progress. It's not fully done, but I wanted to share a little bit about that because it, we, we have some evidence related to consumer access to credit. Uh, so we use Hamda data, which is a loan application, mortgage application uh, for every application in the US. And uh, so we can see whether the loans actually, uh, the application was accepted or denied and whether the loans was originated. And look at also Mintel data, which is uh, a credit offer by fintech and uh, non-fintech firms. Uh, so this is uh, basically, it, it's, we have information about the lenders, we have information about the pricing uh, that the lenders offer to different consumers and some information about consumers' credit risk. Uh, so as I said, the first paper is based on Lending Club data. And Lending Club was, uh, founded in 2006, so it has gone through the whole uh, pretty much uh, economic cycle. And so we, when people apply for a loan, this is consumer loan on the, from the consumer platform. When people apply for a loan on Lending Club platform, what happened is that uh, you pretty much get the tentative res, uh, result decisions immediately. But uh, what, if it is accepted, then the Lending Club assigns its own rating grade from A to G, right? And so if you look at loans that were originated in 2007, it looks like the rating grade is very highly correlated with FICO score, which means that a lot of uh, information used to assign the rating actually is, uh, it's, it's basically not too creative, not really alternative. But over the years, we see that the correlation actually declined from about 80% to only about 30%. And uh, so we can see that uh, increasingly, Lending Club has been using more and more alternative data in assigning a rating grade A to G in the, in the credit decision. And this is A to G assigned and then it's used to, uh, for pricing. So it determines what spread uh, the consumers would, pay, would have to pay. So, uh, so we're going to focus on uh, loans that were originated in 2015. And you can see that from the right uh, panel that this is a distribution of uh, rating grade, uh, of a different FICO segment for different rating grade from A to G. And a lot of, uh, some of the subprime borrowers based on traditional measures, FICO score, actually were rated A or B by Lending Club, so the best rating. 
So we are going to follow these people to see uh, how they actually perform, whether Learning Club actually uh, A to G rating actually is, uh, is make, whether they're making a mistake, right? So, uh, so from the other left panel, the, the plot on the left actually includes only subprime borrowers, only people who actually have FICO below 680, and, but they are rated by, uh, by Learning Club from A to G. And the vertical uh, axis actually ref uh, rep represents uh, default probability within the 24 months after the loan origination. So we can see that actually of all the subprime uh, borrowers, some of, they're not defaulting at the same rate. The A and B consumers actually uh, have very low uh, PD compared to the F or G. So it looks like a, uh, alternative data actually is able to, but uh, has allowed lenders to actually uh, identify what we call invisible prime consumers who are pu pulled in within the subprime, subprime group. And it's the same for the right hand side. Uh, basically, look across all the uh, FICO segments. Okay, I have a few minutes. And so uh, this shows that uh, most of the lending club loans, not 90%, are used for, uh, to pay off credit card balance and uh, for debt consolidation. So we compare credit card rate for people who actually borrow from, uh, from the bank through a credit card with the, with the rate that they have to pay uh, control for FICO score. And we find that there's big saving for these people who actually uh, to borrow from Lending Club to pay off their credit card balance. Now, in terms of credit access, we also see that uh, about 50% of, uh, we try many different measures to uh, helping down index and uh, declining in bank branches just to under, identify underserved uh, areas. And so this shows that about 50% of Lending Club loans uh, were originated in the areas that has less number of bank branches per capita. Now, uh, so overall we find that this alternative data has an important role in identifying, allowing uh, uh, invisible prime consumers to actually be, have access to loan at the, at the much lower cost, right? Uh, I wanted to show also that, so this, is, this shows how the, the lift from uh, using both, well, we include actually not just FICO, there are four different models. FICO score with all the economic factors and risk of the borrowers, including income, uh, employment, uh, uh, credit inquiry, home ownership, everything. But still, with the, without the rating grade, it's still not good enough. And so with the rating grade included as well, there's a lift, significant lift there. Now, just to uh, for mortgage, I wanted to just uh, give you a quick summary, because I only have like two, one, one minute left. So, uh, so using mortgage uh, Hamda data, we find that we find that consumers who apply for a mortgage loan and got denied by traditional lenders actually turn to fintech lenders. So what we find is that area that has a, a lot of denial, high denial rate of uh, mortgage application, which increase the ratio of fintech usage in the, in, the next, uh, in the next period, actually within the county. Uh, now, some statistics that shows that this is from Intel credit offer that uh, Basically, mortgage rate that fintech lenders uh, offer lies between traditional bank and uh, shadow bank lenders. But also, the higher rate between uh, over the traditional bank could also be explained by the fact that actually uh, they make more offers to uh, less credit worthy consumers in terms of uh, uh, lower income and uh, less s s lower FICO score. So overall, uh, basically, we see that alternative data has a role to play in uh, expanding uh, consumer credit and, uh, and at lower cost. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jilapa. Our final speaker of the session is Will Kong of uh, University of Chicago's uh, Booth School of Business. Thank you. Welcome, Will. Very good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about blockchain disruption and smart contracts. Rather than going into the details of a specific paper, uh, what I plan to do is actually to clarify uh, concepts and, and provide you a framework to think about this very new and emerging uh, field of fintech. 
I'm sure many of you have uh, come across all these concepts about blockchain. It, it comes under different names, uh, different articles. This is just showing the Google search uh, for the word blockchain as compared to S&P 500. Um, it, it's scaled, you should notice. The average search is actually more than 10 times. And uh, I'm sure uh, you know that blockchains are also typically associated with cryptocurrencies, which also comes with a gazillion different names, altcoins, crypto tokens, so on and so forth. Um, so what I really hope is by the end of this session, you can take away what exactly is blockchain? What are the key issues that we should look at? Uh, you can approach investing in cryptocurrency or ICOs uh, with, a, with a proper framework. Uh, and that would be my goal today. But towards the end, I also go back to one particular paper on blockchain disruption and smart contract, just to give you some more concrete uh, examples of the mechanism. So. Uh, just yesterday, I uh, read an article, a, a kind of a review article from a top research institution, uh, which is talking about blockchains as if it's Bitcoin. Uh, I'm very opposed to that concept. Bitcoin is an early experiment of the technology. Uh, many people will say, well, uh, the key feature of blockchain is anonymity, because Bitcoin provides this key feature. Well, that's a feature of Bitcoin. But that's a parameter we can design under the blockchain technology. So what exactly is blockchain? Right? I would argue the key innovation for the technology is really decentralized consensus. Uh, and decentralized here is a matter of extent. Right? Even if we are talking about permission blockchain, where a few big institutions uh, form a consortium uh, group and use this uh, shared uh, ledger to record their uh, information, uh, that's also more decentralized than what is traditionally done. Right? So that's, that's what I mean by decentralization. So what is consensus? Well, consensus is a familiar concept. Societies and uh, economies have functioned on consensus for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, typically, it's provided by a centralized party, such as a government, a court, or third-party business arbitrator. So the innovation of uh, blockchain technology is really having a more decentralized way to generate consensus so that even if you don't like the law, you, you're still going to behave uh, as if it's, it were the truth. Right? So that it's a way for people to interact and, uh, and work together. Now, what are the benefits of having a more decentralized consensus? Well, typically, there are two reasons uh, practitioners and uh, academics would give for more decentralized consensus. Number one is we can prevent single points of failure. Uh, it could be a technical failure of a database uh, located in a particular uh, region, for example, cloud computation. If it's located in a particular city and uh, there is a natural disaster, then the system could go down. Whereas if you do it in a more decentralized way, there is certain robustness that we can gain to it. It doesn't have to be technical. It could be a single judge who's uh, uh, prone to uh, bribery or corruption, that could uh, make the, uh, a case uh, uh, a failure. Whereas if we have a more decentralized way of generating consensus, uh, that would prevent this. Another reason people typically talk about is we'll, we'll get more disintermediation. We'll reduce the rent uh, paid to the intermediaries because this, at least for public blockchains, there's free entry. Um, there is a lot of uh, competition for people to compete to provide this service of decentralized consensus. That is an endogenous variable, if I may use an uh, economist term. Um, so, so I don't take a strong stand on that, but these are the typical reasons people give. So given this, there are really two sets of questions we can ask ourselves. The first set is, OK, within the system, how do we provide this decentralized consensus? What are the trade-offs? Is that a sustainable system going forward? Uh, one set of questions, or uh, one subset of this set of questions is, how uh, does this consensus provision uh, game plays out? Uh, I'm sure you've heard of uh, mining games, right? Uh, where miners would uh, compete by solving cryptographic problems or puzzles to win the right to provide this decentralized consensus uh, in the form of recording the next block and getting rewarded for that. 
right? So there, there's a number of studies, at least some references here. Uh, I believe the slides would be available uh, publicly, so, so you can uh, definitely read more into that. Another key question is, many of the protocols, whether proof of work, proof of stake, they are typically under the premise that there is adequate decentralization. That's a technical possibility, but it may not be an economic reality, in the sense that when people actually play the game according to the protocols, they may, uh, there might be centralizing forces. What are some of the centralizing forces? Well, uh, we've all heard uh, how Bitcoin mining is taking up uh, you know, more than 1.5% of uh, uh, US uh, energy consumption is comparable to Switzerland's energy consumption annually. So energy cost is pretty high. Uh, why is that the case? Well, if we want to decentralize, we have to duplicate nodes. We have to uh, update all the nodes in the, in the uh, network. Uh, there is a force for centralization, or at least an argument for centralization to reduce duplication cost. Um, on smart contract and information, I'll come back to that later uh, for, for, for this talk. Uh, there's also an information consideration uh, that's more related to data storage and data uh, processing. Uh, here, I'm just going to give one quick example on uh, another force for uh, centralization, which is resharing. So if we think about uh, miners for Bitcoin or proof of work based blockchains, uh, what they do is they solve these puzzles. Uh, they have a probability of being allocated the right to record the next block and win the reward. But that's random. There's some randomness. Um, so in order to share the risk, very much like an insurance company, mining pools naturally arise. Right? We can draw them together. No matter who successfully mines the next block, uh, we can share the reward. That smooths our uh, consumption, and, and there are benefits to that. Is that going to lead to over-concentration, which defies the purpose of decentralized system? Well, uh, there is a lot of concern, and this is uh, discussed uh, heavily, uh, or debated uh, vehemently in uh, forums among practitioners. So sure, this is just a picture showing the overall global uh, computation power devoted to Bitcoin mining over time. And all these different colors are mining pools plotted as a percentage of global mining power or computation power devoted to this activity. Uh, we, we see rise of mining pools, but it seems that there are some mean reverting forces there, right? So what, what is uh, leading to this? Well, um, yes, risk sharing leads to con uh, concentration of pools, uh, but that's not the only force. There are other forces that would sustain decentralization. For example, if uh, we've taken Finance 101, we know instead of devoting everything to uh, the biggest pool, I can also diversify across smaller pools. That gives me the same uh, diversification benefit. There are also industrial organization forces playing a role. Larger pools are going to charge higher fees, and that's going to uh, make them grow percentagely less. So the key concern is really not over-concentration. It's really about this arms race, where at least under proof-of-work protocols, where we are spending a lot of energy in a tournament that's not socially beneficial. That's just one example of centralization versus decentralization. Now, to summarize that in the a, in a picture here, the internal economics of blockchain, it, it, at least in my humble opinion, is really about balancing three factors. It's very much uh, uh, akin to the uh, uh, you know, impossibility uh, a trinity of uh, international finance where you can have free exchange rate uh, a free capital flow and uh, sovereign monetary policy at the same time. Here is, well, you, it's very hard to have decentralization and consensus and scalability at the same time, which together can provide you a functional trust system. Um, Bitcoin has decentralization and consensus, but it doesn't have scalability. Visa or MasterCards have consensus and scalability, but it's not a decentralized system. So this is something uh, practitioners are actively working on. Uh, whether through uh, layer one or layer two innovations. So I, I'm not going to go into that de detail too much. Now, the second line or second set of questions is, taking the functionality of blockchains as given, how do they impact traditional industries and business? Um, there are many references at least here, uh, including work uh, done by uh, Hannah uh, on platform adoption and auditing that's related to technology as well. 
One quick example I, give, I can give is uh, how ICOs or tokens affect platform of network growth. If this is just plotting Ethereum platform, which is for smart contracting. Uh, I'm plotting both the market cap and the active user address, number of active user address. So as you can see, the endogenous adoption of the platform is closely related to how much these tokens are valued. Right? So uh, in, a, uh, in a separate study, uh, we actually look at the token pricing and the endogenous adoption of users um, to relate this to practice. I just want to point out, we can talk about the fundamental valuation of tokens. Where do they uh, derive value from? Well, they are, they are used as medium or exchange on these platforms. So in that sense, they have some money feature, but they are not stable enough. You can actually show they are inherently uh, volatile. So, so it's not pure money, uh, but at the same time, it's not cash flow based. Um, so it's not our typical investment asset. So it's, a, it's more like a hybrid. And uh, I highly encourage you to, to kind of explore more along that dimension. So that's more relevant for secondary market. If we go back to um, the primary market or, or, or uh, investing uh, in uh, ventures and startups, it's also important to understand the roles of tokens. Uh, actually, I, I just mentioned one role of token, which is accelerating the adoption of platforms, which is very much in line with uh, practitioners' concept of bootstrapping the community, bootstrapping the platform. Uh, I think that's very important to understand. When you look at a uh, startup, if they claim they are using tokens for uh, you know, boosting the community and there's no user network effect for the community, then that's not a valid claim. I think these are concepts uh, important to clarify. So now let me come back to this smart contract a little bit. Um, so this is a paper uh, titled Blockchain Disruption and Smart Contract. The main idea is, okay, we know blockchain provides decentralized consensus. Presumably, that's going to allow us to contract on certain contingency or contingent outcomes. The, let me just jump to the example. I think that's a little bit easier to talk about. I'll come back to these quotes uh, in a little bit. The example I like to use is a trade finance example. When, when an uh, exporter sends, a, sends goods to the importer. Traditionally, well, firstly, this is a three trillion U.S. dollar annual business, and traditionally, it ha it's not very efficient. You, you need to get letter of credit from banks. You need to have multiple paperwork to get it done. The sender doesn't want to send before they receive the payment. The receiver doesn't want to uh, pay before they receive the goods. Right. So, this is where blockchain and smart contract could potentially help. Uh, we could generate a decentralized consensus and and more real-time consensus of the delivery status. For example, the shipment has passed certain ports. Or we can use Internet of Things to monitor the condition of the shipment of wine, for example, from, uh, I don't know, California to New York, whether it's under the proper temperature environment. And based on this uh, consensus, the uh, sender and the receiver can then use smart contract to automate certain transfers of either cryptocurrency or, or uh, the same equivalent value in, in fiat money. Um, so that's where smart contracting could help uh, using the blockchain technology. But at the same time, how do we maintain this decentralized consensus? Remember we're saying, well, if we want it to be very robust, we might have to make it uh, reasonably decentralized, and that requires distribution of information. There are several reasons why that's a concern. Well, firstly, uh, there are several central banks that have reported to generate these consensus or to distribute more information. There is privacy concern of the clients, for sure. Uh, I'd like to focus your attention to the third quote, which uh, says, the technology also facilitates cartel because a few big uh, oligopoly firms can actually observe more information if they are in this blockchain system, and they can tacitly include which is uh, a concern for regulators. And that's something we explore more in this paper. In, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to actually skip this illustration. It's just showing you know, there's a trade-off between decentralization and the quality of consensus we can maintain or generate in this environment. Um, I have one, yeah. 
So let me quickly wrap up um, here, uh, at least uh, in regards to this particular study. Um, to generate decentralized consensus, we necessarily have to distribute more information. And you might say, well, there is proof of work. There are algorithms that allow us to encrypt the information. Um, that should solve the problem. Well, encrypted information is still information. And the more you encrypt the information, the less you can verify or confirm uh, along certain dimensions. So there is a trade-off. Um, so that's something I want to point out. And uh, that uh, should be relevant for how we regulate uh, monopoly and market power uh, and uh, uh, the industrial organization of trade finance. It's just one example. You can think about uh, transactions or trading and clearing, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, there are more details in the references I, I listed. And I hope this is a helpful uh, conceptual framework for everyone to, um, to, to apply. Uh, whether you are in uh, secondary market or uh, primary market uh, investing in ventures. Thank you very much. So I want to I want to give a very warm thank you to to Hannah and to this panel. That was some fascinating stuff. So I think everybody probably wants to go out and figure out how to trade on a triple neural network right about now. <laughs>